The last five years he has served as Harvard's president. He has been passionate and effective as a champion of expanding access to higher education to all students and of strengthening the role of post-secondary education in this country as a public good. It's a privilege for me, it's a privilege for ACE to bestow the honors of Lifetime Achievement Award and the Atwell Medal to my friend and our friend, Larry Backow. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Larry. Well, thank you, Ted, for that incredibly generous introduction um, and for this wonderfully generous award. As I was sitting here, I was saying to myself, I can't wait to hear this guy. I didn't know who he was. Uh, but seriously, uh, I am truly humbled by this uh, acknowledgement because it comes from you. And when I say you, I mean all of you out here, my peers in, in higher education. You know better than anybody else what it means to sort of persist in these leadership roles um, at colleges and universities, especially at a time like this. If the assertion that our institutions move at a glacial pace is accurate, then I think it's fair to say that our, our roles sometimes leave us out in the cold. Uh, I think ACD does many, ACE does many, many wonderful things for higher education. But for me, this is one of its most important contributions, bringing us all together in meetings like this, when we get to learn from each other, where we get to grow and, and connect with each other, where friendships are formed that endure, and where, let's face it, also from time to time, we get to commiserate uh, with each other. Um, I want to thank you all for supporting ACE, for acknowledging me with this wonderful award, and also for working together um, to improve higher education. I just want to follow on with a comment that Ted made earlier. This is an institution, that, an organization that has been very important to me. I've been privileged to serve on its board twice during my time at, at Tufts and now during my time at Harvard. I think it represents the very best of higher education because within ACE, you see the breadth and the diversity of institutions that truly make, I think, higher education what it is in the United States uh, today. Um, as I thought how I wanted to begin my remarks, uh, I thought I'd actually take a minute, if you'd let me to, uh, by remembering one of those people who I think was a friend and colleague to many of us, and I speak of Molly Broad. Uh, for me, and I suspect also for many of you, uh, Molly was truly the steel hand in the velvet glove. Um, she was tough, but elegant. She was outspoken, plain spoken, and I would say soft spoken. And it's almost impossible to find anybody who fits that bill uh, today. It's all too rare, and we actually need more people like that. She led this body with distinction. That's where I first met Molly. Um, she served on all sorts of institutions representing higher education. Uh, but also, she rendered incredible service in her home state of North Carolina um, and elsewhere. Uh, she will be missed, and I just wanted to, to note that. I also want to recognize Bob Atwell, uh, who has already been mentioned to you. Um, I never had the pleasure of actually working with Bob, although we've spoken um, on the phone, but he really helped to lead and shape this organization. Uh, and it's really an honor to be able to give this lecture 
uh, which is named uh, for Bob. In preparing these remarks, I thought about how much the world has changed since I took office at Harvard and how much it has stayed the same. At my inauguration in 2018, I shared some of the challenges higher education was facing. You know, and unfortunately, the list sounds all too familiar. Uh, people who were questioning the value of sending a child off to college. Uh, people who were asking whether or not institutions like ours were worthy of public support. People asking, this is shocking to even say at this mo moment, whether or not colleges and universities were even good for the nation. Well, five years later, I think partisan divides have further intensified these criticisms. Meanwhile, the backlash against higher education has led to efforts to limit what we teach, limit how we teach it, um, and to politicize our governance processes uh, and to discredit diversity as an essential component of our educational missions. I don't think we can ignore these critiques, but we also must not yield to them. Each of us, each of us, I believe, has a role to play to use whatever bully pulpit we have at our disposal to stand up for the values, the values that define our institutions, in fact, the values that define all of higher education. This is hard work, hard work, um, work that actually takes years before it bears fruit, but necessary work, I think, that ensures the relevance and the persistence of our institutions, work we cannot turn away from. Now, standing up for our values demands, in part, that we address insidious sets of actions and a persistent set of inactions that I think threaten part of our core mission. And namely, I think what we do in higher education is we create hope and opportunity by through education. That is why we are here. And I suspect that's what motivates almost every person in the room to get up every morning and do what we do. But here today, what I want to talk to you about are efforts to restrict immigration, to deny access to international students, international scholars, and also to deny access to people who come to this country just seeking freedom and opportunity and a better life for themselves, their children, and their children's children. Uh, unfortunately, at this point in determining who is worthy of entrance into this country, the US seems to increasingly prefer or give preference to those who speak English, those who come with highly valued demonstrable skills, and those who come with sufficient resources to ensure that they never become wards of the state. I suspect if these same criteria had been applied to many of you in this room, to your, to your parents, to your grandparents, we would not be sitting here having this conversation today. And I am certain that I would not be at all. As Ted has already mentioned, both of my parents came to this country as immigrants, as refugees. You know, my father was born and raised in Minsk, and his family tried to escape to get here to combat you know, rising anti-Semitism uh, in, in Eastern Europe. As you heard, my mother was a survivor of Auschwitz. She was the only member of her family to survive. In fact, she was the only Jew from her town who survived. Um, you know, she came to the United States on the second liberty ship that brought refugees from Europe. A liberty ship was a troop ship that had been repurposed to bring refugees uh, to the United States. Um, neither of my parents spoke English. Neither of them had a demonstrative skills. 
and neither of them had any resources. All that they had was a yearning, like so many others, for freedom, for opportunity, for a chance at a life better than the one that they left behind. I'm standing here, I think, just as Secretary Cardona said, as living proof that what we do, that education has the capacity to transform lives. So when Ted talked about my dad, sort of working a series of menial jobs to get an education, he was able to do that because there was a great urban university in Detroit, Michigan, called Wayne State University that gave him a chance. Um, and by the way, if there's anybody here from Wayne State, I want to thank each and every one of you. But it's not just Wayne State. There are many Wayne States uh, in this country. And because Wayne State gave my father a chance at an education, it not only transformed his life, it transformed mine. And not just mine, but life of our children and our grandchildren as well. I always say to people who I'm encouraging to support higher education that there's enormous leverage when you give a child a chance to get a college degree because you change their life and probably the lives of all, um, of all that, that follow. So, you know, I feel like I've been among the luckiest people in the world. I mean, where else can you go literally in one generation from off the boat with nothing? You know, my mother's 20 years old when she gets here. One suitcase, okay, to grow up and have the kind of life and opportunity that I have enjoyed. Um, I think immigration made my life possible and I have never lost sight of that fact. Given my personal background, I have to tell you I've found the last 10 years or so of paralysis in our capital um, around issues of, of immigration to be deeply disturbing, and I would even go so far as to say deeply depressing. Um, ever, efforts to restrict immigration, I think, has a profound effect on how each of our institutions is able to fulfill its mission. We limit immigration, I believe, at our peril. Why? Because first of all, immigration furthers our national interest. But perhaps even more importantly, immigration defines our national identity. Let me speak to the first issue of national interest. And I apologize here if I'm going to sound like the economist that I am. OK, so disclosure. We live in a world right now where the only true scarce capital is human capital, human capital. Financial capital moves at the speed of light okay, in search of higher returns. Anywhere in the world, you hit the button, the money goes. We live in a world right now where it's no longer necessary for nations to be well endowed with natural resources, another form of capital. And to, if you don't understand that, just take a look at the Netherlands. Just take a look at Singapore. Uh, look at Israel, countries that virtually have no natural resources but have been, become uh, wealthy countries. Why? Because they have nurtured, created, and aggregated human capital. Uh, this is, I think, what our institutions do. Now, when we take a, a kid who's had to struggle his or her entire life and we give them a good education, a great education, we are investing in the human capital that our nation needs. When we admit students from abroad, we are aggregating, we are concentrating, we are attracting the human capital uh, that actually, I think, fuels innovation, which helps us uh, to do so many things in our institutions. And they not only bring so much to our places, they also enhance the experience of our domestic students, 
by increasing the nature of the diversity, the quality of conversations um, that occur on our campuses. I think this is one of the many things that have actually produced the greatest higher education system in the world. And how do we know that? We know it because we've stood the test of the market. These talented students and scholars, it's not just students, could go anywhere, anywhere in the world. But instead, they choose to come here. The rest of the world gives us their best and their brightest, and we should want to welcome them um, and, and keep them here. Now, just to illustrate this, and I'm probably not going to share information that most of you don't know, but it's, it's worth considering. The Fortune 500 companies, more than 40% of them are run either by immigrants or children of immigrants, almost all educated, at least in part, in the United States. Um, they represent 68 different industries and collectively employ almost 15 million people. All right. um, another way to, to think about this, Nobel Prizes, and there are lots of statistics cited about this, but if you take a look since 1901, you go back that far, 15% of all Nobel Prizes awarded to US citizens have gone to people who came from somewhere else. Individuals who've taught generations of students many of them on our campuses. People who've become those students who themselves have become leaders in their field. Uh, these individuals have strengthened our academic communities uh, and they've not only done that, they've strengthened our country by their example, by the fruits of their scholarship, of their teaching. Um, they've also helped us to do something that I think is really important at this moment in time. They've helped us to build collaborations, scholarly collaborations, with other countries that are durable, that are long-lasting, um, especially collaborations between scholars where their nations are in tension. All right? And I would tell you that when it's difficult for nations to come together, this is the time in which we want students and scholars to come together. Because often, institutions like ours, universities, colleges, are capable of doing things which their governments cannot. Building the kinds of relationships between people that help to pull their nations together. I think that's, that's really, really important. At Harvard, 25% uh, of our students are international students. A third of our faculty came from someplace else. I've now been at three different institutions, and yes, Ted, each no more than two stops on the red line from Harvard Square. Uh, but these patterns exist at these other institutions as well. I think America thrives when the world's best join us to pursue research that fuels discovery and innovation. These international students challenge our domestic students in the classroom. Um, and they, many of them want to stay here, build their families in their, in careers in the U.S. after graduation. And even if they leave this country, even if they take their degrees and go home, we are still contributing much to the world because why? They take a little bit of us with them. They take a little bit of our values. They take a little bit of how a great, system of public higher education manages to help engage and create opportunities um, for, for everyone. So I think immigration is truly in our national interest. I think higher education helps to serve our national interest by attracting and educating students from around the world. And these students who become our alumni continue to enrich life in, in so many, so many different ways. Unfortunately, we cannot take this for granted because the rest of the world has figured out that this is important as well. Governments are making it far easier, far easier than our government is to welcome international students to their campuses. They are creating economic incentives for those students to come and also economic incentives for them to stay. 
Uh, there's a global market for talent right now, and we need to recognize that and not take that for granted. Ours is a country that's always prided itself on being a beacon of freedom and opportunity for others, and we must continue to do so. It brings me pain, actually, knowing that my parents and many of your parents and your grandparents would not recognize this country today. We are turning our backs on those who just want to come here to seek a better life, a better future. And here I'm not talking about people that are likely to win a Nobel Prize. I'm not talking about people who are likely uh, to lead Fortune 500 companies. Uh, most of us are never going to do that, let's face it. But I'm speaking about people who want to come here because they seek to escape bigotry. They seek to escape hatred. They seek to escape violence. They seek to escape poverty. Um, people who are in this country because they are currently uh, on temporary protected status. These people are truly worthy of our embrace. I think how we treat the least powerful among us is a good measure of the virtue of any society. And for those who are coming from parts of the world where they have truly suffered, I think we have a special responsibility to reach out to them. We need an immigration system that's smart, compassionate, and fair. Now, ultimately, we can't do that. Let's face it, that's, we can't do it. It's really not our job to do it. It's Congress's job, okay? Congress needs to do that if we're gonna, if we're gonna change. Um, but for those of us who have influence, for those of us who are entrusted with a bully pulpit, I think it's imperative that we advocate for change. Um, consider the case of dreamers. You know, I suspect all of us have some of them uh, on our campus. Uh, or students who don't even enjoy the status of dreamers. Students who are in this country illegally. Uh, think about those. I, you know, these are, these are young people who were brought here by their parents who have never known, as we all know, any other place, and you know, who live in a state of suspended animation, um, never knowing whether or not they will be allowed to stay and contribute their talents to our society. And you know, I recently had a student as an advisee a few years ago. I take a group of first-year students as advisees um, every year. For a president, it's a good way to stay grounded and understand how things look you know, through the eyes of students. And uh, this student was a, uh, an illegal immigrant in this country, uh, came, was brought here by her parents at a very, very early age. This student can't fly home. Why? No government-issued ID. Only way to get home is on a bus. And if the trip home is longer uh, than she has time available to take a break, she has to stay here. Our, our, our students, our illegal students, face other challenges. Uh, when they graduate, they can't work legally. It's difficult for them to continue their studies or education. These are challenges which I think uh, none of us, or I suspect few of us, uh, had to face. Um, so, you know, the secretary said something early and Ted reinforced it. What can we do here? I do think it's important to tell our stories, to tell the stories of your students, of the people who have struggled to try and get here, and what's happened to them after that. So, let me tell a few stories, you know, <laughs> that come from uh, my campus, because stories really matter. They take issues that sort of get talked about in abstraction, but they bring them down to a level that people can really understand and understand what our policies are doing to people, to human beings. Um, we had a, a young man uh, at Harvard a few years ago. His name was Jin Park. He was a DACA student, okay? Uh, and 
he was actually the very first dreamer awarded a Rhodes Scholarship, okay? Not an inconsequential uh, accomplishment. Uh, this, is, this is quite a journey for a kid who came to this country as a seven-year-old from Korea, not speaking a word of English. In fact, the only words he knew, the only words he knew were home alone because somebody had shown him a movie. He could not understand anything else, but it kept saying home alone. That was it, that was it for Jin. Now, when he received a Rhodes, he could, he could go to Oxford. Our, you know, our policies for DACA recipients allowed them to leave this country. The problem is, it wasn't clear that he could get back. Once gone, you're gone. So, you know, we went to bat for him, or I should say our senators and congressmen went for, to bat for him, uh, got him an exemption, um, special exemption, and Jin was able to go to Oxford, you know, receive his master's degree that comes with a Rhodes Scholarship, and then when he returned uh, back, he made it back in the United States. He's now an MD student um, at Harvard Medical School in our program, it's called the Health Science and Technology Program, which is joint with MIT. This is the most competitive program to gain admission to at Harvard University. I'm, I say that because I want you to understand how far he has come to get to where he is. And if you think about it, making life difficult for him and for others like him does not advance our national interests. In fact, it alienates our national treasures. Our students are our national treasures. But I think telling stories is not enough. Um, we must also act. Another story. Uh, in 2019, we had a young Palestinian student who was admitted to Harvard. Um, but when he arrived at the airport in Boston, he was turned away by the US Immigration um, and Customs um, Enforcement. Uh, didn't know why he was turned away, but he literally was put on the next plane back to Lebanon without any explanation. Never even made it past customs, all right? With some allegation, you know, some reference to the fact that he had some things on his cell phone that made the customs officials question, you know, where he was coming from, not physically, but, but otherwise. Um, eventually, we managed to get him a new visa. You know, within a couple of days, he was back on campus. He was able to, able to get past customs at Logan and joined his class, classmates, for the start of, uh, of his classes. Um, I use this plight to illustrate the disruption, the delays, um, the scrutiny and suspicion uh, that at this time were all being directed, all being directed to international students and scholars in the name of national security. It goes on. But let me come back to our student because this remarkable young man who was raised in a refugee camp in Lebanon, okay, and gets to Harvard on his own, will graduate this May. Now, less than a year after that incident, less than a year, um, during the, the pandemic, the middle of the pandemic, and you probably will know what I'm about to tell you, the same US um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement sought to expel all of our international students, if their institutions had switched to remote instruction. Why? Because the government had concluded that if we were teaching people and they were learning all remotely, there was no longer any reason for them to be in this country. So this order comes down out of the blue and we were about to expel, if you will, all of our foreign students to go home in the middle of a pandemic on airplanes, back to places that uh, 
you know, had less control over the virus than we did, uh, places where students had, did not have access to internet, so they actually couldn't study online, um, I could go on. Um, it was really a cruel and reckless act um, that I thought, you know, this is really going to disrupt the lives of many. So together with our colleagues down the street at MIT, we decided to challenge this. We sued and we won. And actually in a little over a week, the government backed down and uh, a million college students were able, uh, foreign students, excuse me, international students were able to remain uh, in this country. Thank you. But when I say we won, we won, okay? We did not do this on our own. I always say that no, no individual accomplishes anything on their own, and it's true about institutions as well. We were backed in this effort by ACE. We were backed in this effort um, by all the higher education associations. We were backed in this effort by countless co you know, colleges and universities. This was not just about two places, it was about all of our places. And we could not have done this on their own. And for that, I want to say to all of you, thank you. And I want to say thank you on behalf of all of our international students. Now, most actions that we take are not that conspicuous. Yeah, you can applaud yourself. I will, I will applaud you as well. So not a, every action that we take you know, winds up on the front pages of, of newspapers. Some we do much more quietly. And some of these, I think, are among the most impactful things that we can do. Again, a story um, from Harvard, but I'm sure you all have your stories. Um, we have a, a program uh, at, at Harvard. We call it the Bridge Program. And the Bridge Program is aimed really at our employees, and employees who really are sort of menial employees in, in many cases, the kinds of jobs my father did when he, when he started out. And what this, job do, what this program does is it helps these folks learn English, it helps them study for their citizenship exam, uh, it helps them lift their sights for what is possible for them professionally. And actually, uh, it's all done with volunteers. And at the end of each year, we actually ha hold a wonderful ceremony for those who have received their citizenship. Uh, it, it's an extraordinarily effective program. I suspect many of you uh, have similar programs. If you don't, it's, it's amazingly cost effective because you really don't have to pay anyone. It's our students, it's our faculty, it's our staff, it's our alumni actually who volunteer their time uh, to do this. By the way, it's a great way to engage alumni who want to be involved with our institutions and, and having them do something which has a real tangible benefit and they see that um, up front. At, at my inauguration, as I suspect many inaugurations, we've got a tradition that there's a faculty member who speaks, there's a student who speaks, and there's a staff member to speak. I think one of the best speeches at my inauguration, certainly better than mine, um, was given by a staff member, Calixto San. Now, Calixto credits the bridge program with his successful career at Harvard. He came to the United States from Columbia, and he did so seeking to get an education, improve the quality of education. So he took a low-paying job at Harvard as a cashier in one of our cafeterias at the medical school. And he did that so that he could make money to attend the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. And through the bridge program, he managed to get an internship at Harvard in our IT department while he was studying at UMass Lowell. That internship actually led to a job in a laboratory, and Calixto, like you know, many immigrants, you know, was willing to, to work really, really hard. And for those of you who've seen Hamilton, you know, there's this wonderful song, Immigrants Get the Job Done. Calixto was a good example of that. Today, Calixto is running the largest single laboratory at Harvard Medical School, okay? Calixto's life 
was altered by the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, who gave him an education, and helped along by our bridge program, which gave him sort of the first step on that ladder that he needed uh, to progress. Um, now, if you, if you want more examples of how this, this kind of work is really, really done, and done, I think, exceptionally well, don't look at Harvard, okay? I mean that. Don't look at us. Um, because I think there are places who've had a lot more experience than this than we have. A lot more experience helping non-traditional students, students who have other needs than the kinds of students that we typically encounter. I'm talking about our community colleges. I'm talking about our minority serving institutions. I'm talking about our urban public institutions like the Wayne States um, of the world. Uh, I was doing some research for this talk. Nearly a third of their student populations come from immigrant, immigrant backgrounds. Many, as you know, because they're your students, are adult learners. Um, what I have just described as noteworthy at Harvard occurs routinely um, at many of your own institutions, places that are addressing needs far beyond what we have to. And if I, if I stop to catalog those needs, uh, you'd be here farther, lo far longer than I'm already uh, keeping you uh, today. But I, I think institutions that help people like Calixto and help them routinely are doing God's work. And you are worthy of our support, worthy of our partnership, worthy of our engagement. But when we do that, places like ours need to listen to others to ask how we can be helpful. This should not be, you know, big university coming and saying, all right, here's what we're going to do for you. It has to work the other way around. And I think it's up to us to work together with you um, to enable uh, the American dream. When this happens, it does amazing, amazing things, including what it does in higher education. As I was thinking about this talk, I, I was thinking about my colleagues uh, who are university presidents in Boston. And we got a lot of universities. And if you look around, what do you see? You see all these places being run by immigrants. You look at Northeastern University, Joseph Aoun, born in Lebanon. You see the new president of Tufts University, Sunil um, Kumar, uh, born in India. Uh, you look at the president of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, uh, Marcello uh, Suarez Orozco, um, born in Argentina. You look at the recently retired president of my alma mater, MIT, Rafael Reif. Uh, Rafael was born in Venezuela. You look at the president of Bunker Hill Community College, Pam Edinger, a good friend. I don't know if Pam's here, um, but born in Hong Kong. All right. This is affecting all of us, and, and this is the kind of talent that we need um, to draw uh, to our institutions. So I always say, and I, people have said this countless times, but in, in slightly different words, talent is flatly distributed. You will find a talent anywhere and actually in the same proportion as you will. You'll find it that way in the poorest countries in the world as you will in the richest. Okay, there's talent everywhere. What is missing is opportunity. And it's imperative that we give opportunity to others. That is our business. Our business is to create, is to create opportunity. So actually, as I leave you, because I'm just about done, I'd like to actually quote some wisdom from Bob Atwell, okay, who I think had something important to say about this. And I'm going to quote Bob. ACE is based on persuasion, moral persuasion. We don't have the opportunity, we, excuse me, we don't have the authority over anybody. Do we have influence? Yes, I think we do. So we have seen our role to be one of attempting to lead by persuasion, but not by anything else. I think there's a lot for all of us to take from that. Because Bob was not just talking about ACE, 
He was talking about every single one of us as educational leaders. We need to go out and persuade people that what we do is important. Persuade people that we give young people opportunity. Persuade people that we are worthy of public support. Persuade people that we are good for society and good for this nation. Moral persuasion is a very, very powerful, powerful thing. Today, I appeal to your sense of fairness. All of us in this room are here, I think, because of the generosity and work of those who came before us. We now need to ask ourselves, what are we gonna do to create opportunity for the next generation? I hope the answer from all of you is everything we can, because the world depends upon us. Thank you very much.